say, for those drought years to come. So right off the bat, we'll divide by two because our motto is take half, leave half. Uh, you always want to leave something um, for further recruitment, further seeding, and also to prepare for those drought years. And then we also, just, just to preface kind of our permits, we base those on a best case scenario. So that's kind of your either good average year or above average precipitation year. So even when we issue our permits, we, we tell all of our operators, look, it's rare that you should be full permit. Uh, so a lot, of them, a lot of them do go full permit, but some of them do try to do their best to scale it back um, where they're grazing maybe 35% utilization, but we never want more than 50% utilization. So I guess just to more, more, I guess directly to what we're discussing here, what we've come up with for the Buffalo Tract, the Las Vegas Creek allotment is what we call it. Uh, one of the one of the oldest range summaries I could find in our files in 1981, and this was based on fair range conditions, which I think most of you that are familiar with the area can say, yeah, fair to maybe not so fair at times. Uh, but it was calculated at six to 11 acres per AUM. And then in 1988, it was calculated at eight acres per AUM. And then in 1998, it went up just slightly, but they were, that one kind of had some other things going on. They were looking at just the north pasture versus the south pasture, and that was at 8.4 acres per AUM. I know that's a lot of numbers. It probably doesn't mean anything, and you won't write it down or utilize it, but currently the permit that is on Las Vegas Creek is 60 cattle for eight months. And what we have on the public land forest side is 388 AUMs. If that were going to be utilized for horses, which we don't allow all horse allotments, but if, like I said, if it was trying to be utilized as a expected um, um, horses go further from water, they go up steeper slopes, and they obviously consume more than cattle do, they'll consume up to 36 pounds per day of dry matter intake. So we use a conversion factor of 1.8 AUM equivalency. So it takes 1.8 cattle AUMs to equal the horse would consume. So you would almost divide that 388 AUMs by two. It would be, so for, for the buffalo tract, um, it would be 18 horses continuous on, I believe it's 3,100 acres, right. approximately. You get that, when you look at the AUM number two, that's assuming that you, know, you feel like a big number, like the 388 AUMs, that means that if we have, 388 cattle out there for one month, then it's over. You know, then that would essentially mean that it would consume the maximum, and that's you know. So typically, when we do the permits, you know, based on it would be based on season, and you know, sometimes we do go year round. So then, if we determine that it's you know 120 AUMs, then year round, obviously, you divide that by by 12, so that equates to you know 10 cows, 10 cows, no cows, 10 cows for the entire year. You know, and that's, that would be the maximum. Uh, and when we do our analysis, keeping in mind that, you know, BLM, we're still that, we still have that multi-use mandate. And so as we go through our analysis, because every permit goes through an EPA process, you know, we, we'll have to take into consideration other, other uses for forage. You know, because we have wildlife, you know, deer, elk, and what have you out there. You know, so depending on essentially what the analysis comes back with and what our wildlife knowledge is, what our, you know, other folks tell us, you know, then we take those things into consideration. So, um, and that's essentially the, the gist of the program. I mean, it's, uh, it's a, I know, a quick and dirty description of it, but uh, you know, I guess if there's any questions, the board here. Do you have any answer questions, sir? Sure. How does uh, property owners feeding the horses equate? As far as meaning, so I'm sorry. What was well, on my ranch, I have a herd. Okay. That comes up constantly. They're all named. That wash them, have babies, and I feed them. Now, with the BLM property, I have <coughs> nine thousand acres on each side of my property. There is BLM because these horses they live here. I guess my question is, are feeding these horses, how does that play with, with your figure? It doesn't. Um, and, 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 I think, and I think, 
You know, and I've seen a lot of different figures, and, and you really have to have to adopt the qualifiers with the figures. Sure. Because I, I know I've seen a comparison, like saying that you know, cow eats about eats about 160 pounds of feed to meet nutritional needs, and a horse needs about 30 pounds. But the comparison, you have to really look at what you're comparing um, and how we do the management. <laughs> is that we manage based on what ecosystem and the race can provide. Yeah, and that's true that a cow needs about 160 pounds, but that's green grass, you know, so that it still has to be converted to dry matter. When you look at the number that says, horse only eats 30, well, yeah, but that's under control conditions and that's dry matter. So dry matter to wet grass is not the same thing. Control condition to just free grazing is not the same thing. And so for us, we don't, we don't allow uh, feeding on, only under certain circumstances on the range. And if they do feed, it has to be under drop conditions. It has to be certified weed free because just one bat batch of alfalfa will damage an entire ecosystem. It really will. Sure. And so again, so our, 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 pro our programs don't take into account feeding. You know, we look at the range, we look at the ecosystem, we look at conditions, we look at the other uses. And then again, we, we assume that it's, it's free ranging. You know, it's not in a stall feeding and controlling that feed. It's how much they're going to eat when they're out there. And, and again, feel this uh, physiologically, you know, when you compare again horses to cows, <coughs> and uh, Dr. Zimmerman can correct me here if I'm wrong, um, the cow digestive system, they understand when they reach their capacity for nutritional needs. Horses don't have that. Horses essentially have that need to eat constantly. You know, one of the things that horses don't have is things like a gallbladder, you know, where they can store bile, you know, where cows do, we do, you know, so we store bile, we do release it to the or two, essentially ingest the, you know, the fast in our lower intestine. Horses don't. Horses essentially produce that constantly. So they have that constant need to eat. Uh, the other thing too is the proton pump, you know, on horses, we have it, you know, we essentially release the acid in our stomachs. Horses produce that constantly, you know, so they have that that ability to eat constantly, you know. And a free range, you know, when we look at those numbers, we know that free range, again, that's comparing free range to free range, not what, what you can feed a horse to sustain it. That's free range to free range. You know, I think we've seen numbers where, you know, 70% of the horse's daylight hours are spent grazing, and 50% of the nighttime hours are spent grazing. Where a cow, usually it's about eight hours spread out throughout the, throughout the day. And so, you know, we take those things into consideration, and that's why when we do horse equivalency AUMs to cows, you know, it comes out to 1.8, meaning, you know, we assume that, you know, a horse will not eat, again, free range heating 80% above what a cow will do it, will do. And so that's, those are the things that we consider, again, as, as Adam said, you know, we kind of try to cut that in half, because there's other uses for the range, you know, and so that's how we set our, our numbers. I've held, Adam, I want to give you a time check. It's 2.22. That's um, a little bit off. You have until 2.35. Yes, was there any uh, assessment of species and the prevalence of desirable species and also prevalence of persistent invasive like snake weed, other considerations like that? And also, was, do you take any... Um, um, assessment of, of whether or not the land is degrading and eroding. Right. Absolutely. I don't have those numbers or data in front of me, but yes, that's every time we go out there when we're doing our monitoring. So the way we check utilization is of our key forest species, and for that area for grass, we're check, checking for uh, blue grandma, gaeta. Uh, there is some needle and thread which is used kind of after those two. Uh, there is some cyclone in the bottom, that's another a good indicator of utilization. But we're also at the same time checking other for other species composition and richness. And yes, we have absolutely seen. We haven't done, I think, some monitoring in a couple few years out there. But in 14, uh, we did 2007, 2010, 12, and 14. And over those four years, we got total points and the data. And we definitely see a downward trend in our beneficial species and a upward trend in proof snake weed and our undesirable invaders. So we have the ability to make the adjustments on loading capacity. Um, you know, the CETAs hasn't been how many years? When was the last year that it was grazed for cattle? It's been at least over a decade, and that's because the lack of, you know, a, a forest to be able to sustain anything really out there. 
And so, you know, but we do that across the board. You know, it's not necessarily just focused on one area. Again, because our, our, our intent is to look at it on a broader ecological basis than just one thing. The uh, snakeweed has migrated, it's migrating north on the BLM. Uh, what is being done to mitigate the uh, snakeweed? You guys doing anything about it? Uh, what can we don't, be done about it? Yeah, we don't. It's one of those species we don't actively treat because it is a native and it is cyclical. Um, but where it becomes dominant is in degraded rain sites, and typically our prescription for those, these type of sites is rest. Yeah. It's just so hard to yeah manually remove it or chemical. Uh, it, and and the, the underlying problem is the degraded rain site. So no matter how much money you put into getting rid of the snakeweed you don't have any beneficials to come in and out compete because the seed is in the soil. So it's how, how much, very how, difficult to control. How much of Placidas, uh, the buffalo track, has snakeweed now? You know, I don't know if, if I were to give you a percentage. It would be almost any flat area out there would probably be, it would probably be the dominant species. I would, I would guess that's a, that's a guess. Yeah. What well, choose Back there. Just had her hand up for patient. Yes, hi, I'm Patience O'Dowd. Um, a couple of things. Um, you mentioned that an AUM, one AUM for a cow is equal, is the same for 1.8 for a horse. But don't you mean a cow calf? Well, we that's lumped into the same category. A cow calf is the same as a, a full grown cow, is how we rate it in the federal system. Okay, I think that's important to state. Um, the other thing that's kind of important to state, a number of other things, one is that um, when horses um, eat the food, um, they, they do have different stomachs. They don't produce all the methane that cattle do, which is 84 times more heat trapping than CO2. Um, to mention, you had said there's been no cattle out there. Yes, there have. I have pictures of them. Um, and they were out there uh, last winter or last last year cattle so I'll send those to you um, and uh, let's see so when when a horse eats they are not ruminants they don't have multiple stomachs they have a cecum and what they do is they scarify the seeds that means the seeds easily grow so when they eat their food, they replant it, unlike cattle who, when they eat the food, they kill it, and they kill the seeds. They're very efficient with those three stomachs. And so horses actually, as they roam, they replant as they go. And they don't keep eating in one spot. Moreover, they have upper front teeth, like no ruminant does except a cattle. Now with upper front teeth, that enables them to mow which is very important for native species um, because uh, mowing uh, does not pull on the roots or the important parts of the plant. So, I have a question. Um, but no, I have, I have a question. I'm still not done. Well, what you're saying is really important to understand the concept. It's here. propaganda. No, it's not. So, okay, okay. 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 so the, um, I'm telling Adam, patients, have the floor. Patients have the floor. Uh, uh, and, uh, 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 understood. Patients, please ask your question because we've got about six minutes left before the presentation. Okay. Um, so uh, I don't know if you're aware, but the grazing permits out there are illegal, and um, I have shared that with New Mexico First and the BLM as to why. Um, and I would like to see your data from um, 10, 12, and 14. And my question is... Um, out of curiosity, what's your basis for them being illegal? Uh, well, under the Taylor Grazing Act, you have to put in specific forms, paperwork, when you stop grazing. Under the Taylor Grazing Act, you can't just say, I'm not going to graze this year. You have to graze, or you have to get a, a Maya Koopa, or whatever that's called, for not grazing. And the only one, uh, so this is one of the grazing permits out there, the only one who, after I brought this up, turned in anything, turned in a handwritten note saying, uh, chicken scratch, saying, uh, I'm not grazing. Now, that's the one that's out there grazing this last year, by the way. Well, the, <laughs> 
I think it's an education for everybody. And the other, the other permit was paying um, for his grazing permit every year as if he was putting cattle out there that was fraud to maintain his permit, but he was not putting cattle out there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now just to clarify, the, the, the Tenure Grazing Act, historically, the reason it was developed is so that we can manage to raise, you know, better than we did in the past. And it doesn't require that you graze. It requires that we manage the grazing uh, of federal lands. You know, that's, that's what it requires. And so, in essence, if, if there is conditions to where, you know, the the uh, the allottee, the permittee, you know, that's not financially sound for them to have cattle out there, which again, you know, federal land is not a storage facility for, for livestock, but rather, you know, it's for utilization. The rancher does not have the right to the land, but rather they have the right to to part of that forage. But without the when the forage doesn't exist there, then essentially there is no need for that. You know, for that, you know, we're not gonna we're, we're not gonna beat the ground to death, and so then the rancher has the ability to voluntarily, you know, take years in suspension, you know, and uh, and we can enter into those agreements. And again, you know, our, our goal has been to to make it is ultimately to make sure that that land lasts for you know as long as we're around. And so if we have to put it to rest, we put it to rest. Quite often, that is not an untypical thing to do. Again, because. The Taylor Grazing Act does not require that you graze the land. It requires that we manage the grazing on the land. But you have to fill out the paperwork if you're not going to graze. And there are treatments for snakeweed. I think we've got time for one more question. I think this lady first. Okay. I'd like to um, thank you for stating that horses need to work. Yeah. Yeah. But I want to make sure that I understand the layman error that you fall apart and I'm holding up to you based on the calculations that you've made. This Buffalo track area that that would be under ideal conditions, as you mentioned. That's not deal. We're not in No, we are not. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, I have two questions here. And one, I really thank patients for stating something obvious. Horses do not eat more than cattle. That is propaganda right there. First, I would like to ask you a question. Do you own horses yourself? Mexico State University now. Okay, so how, you're making money department. off of the ranchers, okay? And the point here is that you are biased to the cattle being on this property more so than the free roaming horses. Let's make it very clear that you make money off the ranchers, you don't make money off the free roaming horses. To state that the fact that horses are destroying the land over cattle, there are videos, there are documentation showing that cattle destroys land more so than free roaming horses. Okay, so what you're saying is propaganda. So right is here. there a question? This is about question and answer. Yeah, my question is do you own horses personally? Of course. Yes. I was yeah. born into horses and so was he. Okay, and so when you watch horses eat, you notice that they don't pull up everything when they graze. No, but Cattle I'll tell you street. from personal experience, uh -huh. I, had, I was born into horses. Mm -hmm. Horses for me, it's, it's a love affair. You know, I, I was not, I didn't like discover them at a later age. Um, you know, as, if, if you graze a horse in a pasture, and this is a pasture, you know, you will, you will wipe out your pasture if you do not essentially manage that better. And the reason for that, Phil is, you know, the physiology of the horse is that they are low grazers. Um, and so they will eat those low grasses and the grass will grow tall around them, but they'll continue to eat that one area that's low because they prefer that grass, you know, because it is higher in sugars and it actually tastes better for them. You know, and so ultimately what you wind up is you wind up with bare spots. Anybody who has ever, who was ever born into horses and has ever passed your horse has seen that. Yeah. You know, the problem, and this is different. Horse is wrong. And that's why you and that's a you got, Exactly. And that's the thing. Horse you, is wrong. When you're talking about free range, you don't manage it in that same way. Again, so when you're comparing, comparing managing a cow and measuring the weight of what they eat to managing a horse and measuring the weight of what they eat, when it's being managed by human beings, it's a different number. But when you release the animal into the free range, it's a very different scenario. Again, comparing it to the pasture to free range grasses that we have, the problem with our grasses is that they require a certain time to, in, in order for them to come back. They will get to a point where, again, low grazing happens, they will be gone. They're gone. Whether the horse can distribute the seeds or not, the problem is, is whether that seed has the ability to come back. And so that's kind of what we see. And, and again, no, it's drought. we look at it very broadly and we look at the ecosystem differently. It's drought. So sure that everything, everything is and how is the cattle benefiting? How so is the cattle need, benefiting? We need to move on. We've 
we've got lots more to get to. Adam Angel, can you please let people know where they can go for resources? And if we have time at the end, or if you're around, some of these sidebar you know, um, questions can occur. Oh, you can go oh. pretty much to any university that has an active department. Hi, hi, this one, Taylor Mustang spoken you know, yet. Yeah. No. services, I mean, the data's there, and again, you know, when you read it, you know, you compare apples to apples, and I mean, that thing is, not anything that we develop, it's essentially data that's developed for us, you know, with people that, that have that. So you can pretty much go to Oregon State University for that. But, but you're not interested, could you, I asked yeah, you yeah. why, do, what's the benefit of cattle on this, on we've, the bubble we've track? Got, we've got other presentations and lots of public comments. Thank you very much, BLM. There's obviously a lot of interest here. Potentially, we can talk about a, um, a longer presentation at an, at an upcoming meeting. Um, or so an alternate you. presentation. So, um, <laughs> moving on, Dr. Hernan. <laughs> Yeah. You know it's always going to be live. So you'll recognize these are some of our Placidus community horses. Um, today we have counted 124 horses roaming in 19 bands and still counting. We have mares that are pregnant that look like they are going to foal, so we're still um, adding to that population survey. We have 65 mares and fillies treated with PZP with the primer dose and 53 that have been boosted. And those are the main focus areas that we've been out and about treating horses and counting them in our community. So I see some new faces in the room, and I also know that there are a number of people here that are really familiar with PZP. Mm -hmm. um, because we have some new people, I'm just going to run down um, a little bit of the background mm -hmm. of porcine zona pellucida. Um, PZP is a vaccine against conception, and it's reversible. So that's been a key point that's come up a number of times. If we want mares to continue to foal, then we just don't give them the booster dose and they can return to breeding and they will foal. PZP is safe for pregnant mares, foals in utero, the environment, and other wildlife. Treatment this year prevents births next year. So you'll see two of the births that occurred this year in this photo, um, and we're looking to reduce that next year. Abscesses at the injection site are normal, and we have seen some of those um, in some of our placebo sources. They self-resolve. It's not like it's not, it's not unlike any of us who get a flu vaccine. You might have a bump on your arm, and you got the vaccine, and it goes away over time. And we have over 30 years of research that shows that PZP is safe um, for treated mares and safe over time. So when we start to look at considerations for the health of the Placidus community horses, we've got a couple here. So when you look at the, this foal in this photo was born in January. Um, it's likely that we have an extended breeding season now and possibly higher reproduction rates because many of the horses are being fed. So it's both the continuously available forage and the richness of the forage that many of the horses are being fed. And we checked that out with our colleagues, doctors John Turner and Alan Rutberg, and they concur that that's likely. Um, we have heard of some injuries and deaths that are occurring for the Placidus herd as bands compete for forage, that they're being fed, not forage out on the range. So we're aware of one foal that was kicked to death by a rival um, stud, or a, a stud from a rival band, and we've had some other foals that have been found dead or disappeared, so it's unclear what happened to them. Um, and, but we've seen some conflict in areas between bands where they're being fed, and it's likely that band disbursement, that they're more concentrated now, because they're being fed and watered in different areas of the community, um, because forage and water um, naturally level is somewhat limited. So we've talked before that the third component of the Mount Taylor Mustangs proposal is to draft a working draft of a herd management plan. And that that will be grounded in data from both the population survey as well as PZP treatment. 
So when we start to talk about some of the considerations for that plan, and this is not an exhaustive list, um, one of the things that we'll need to look at is how do we make more room for the herd, for their health and their safety, and also for the health and safety of our community, and make more room about the very divergent views that we hold about these horses in our community. Um, so we're also, obviously, as we heard today, we'll have to look at range health and forage and water availability as factors as well. Um, so the goal will be to develop a working draft that includes potential goals for achieving and sustaining healthy horses and healthy range right now and then as we move forward together. We expect to have a draft outline of that herd management plan available at the next uh, free roaming advisory council meeting. And the last thing I'd like to say is thank you all. Um, we honor and respect that there's been a lot of work done on this issue in this community for years now, actually. Um, and as I said, we've heard very different um, views about the horses and about them belonging and not belonging when we've been out in the community. Um, the community has been very supportive of the work on the ground when we encounter people out there, and we appreciate that because we're all in this together. And so to the point that we can actually hear each other and respect different views and find any areas where we can work to, together, it'll be better for our community, for us living here, and better for the persons who are living in the range. Dr. Murray, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, um, I noticed that you didn't include uh, further of I-65, 165 past the village, and we have a herd up there have for a few years, it ranges, you know, up to 14. Um, are you are going to come up there and? So and, my know, apologies. already dropped one pole. We got two pregnant mares, and you know. My apologies if it wasn't clear. We actually have been up there, so well, that wasn't clear here. in the slide. Okay. My apologies. And then, then yeah, and, and we're going to and we're keeping going. Just and so my other know. question is, it's pretty typical in the American West if you want to control uh, population of your herd of horses to castrate colts. And um, I know that takes cowboys. Um, I mean, I worked at Acoma for 10 years and saw it repeatedly. Do, does the plan for population control, and it's pretty clear that you've got more horses than the land you're looking at is gonna hold. Is there any notion that as uh, these mares drop their foals, that you know, you go out and you castrate the, you know, what is it, gill, the uh, colts, and uh, I mean, are we going to have stallions fighting? I mean, you say we already have conflict territory, something they're going to fight over too, uh, in my driveway. So certainly, gelding is one option. And you all, you know, have you considered it? Are you planning on doing it? It's so it's not, yeah it's yeah not actually so, so they're contract. yeah so they, so they are the contracted vendor with the county right. and they're contracted to do PCP um, not not guilty so but, but they're writing a plan for the future and so are they planning on including gelding as a recommendation a very reasonable American Western way to control uh, a horse herd it's a potential option that the community could consider yes. Well, okay. Karen, um, your, your number of 124 <laughs> horses, does that include a new foals? Do you have any idea how many new foals there were this year, given the information for us? We've got about 28 on the ground so far and counting. We have mares that are heavily pregnant that we anticipate. So the 124 includes those 20 Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I put in an inspection public records request. Uh, Karen, you may or may not know about that, do you? And um, in the in our in our in our bid for contract, in our search for p contractors such as yourself, Mount Taylor Mustangs, Karen Herman, um, it was basically asked, "How are you going to prove that you did what you said you were going to do?" Like in any contract, you want to hire, and then you want to make sure that it was done. Um, 
and also in the bid and also in the contract, um, uh, what we expect and what the contracts and the bids, all that, was a picture, a pictorial proof of each horse. So if you're out there and you're seeing 119 horses, um, you're not flying a helicopter, you're not doing it by helicopter, um, they're on foot or they're on car or whatever. So a picture, a picture is proof and we get to see what horses we have. We also get to see when a horse is darted, a picture is taken, is it not? And if one is boosted, a picture is taken. But I've asked for that and I'm, I haven't gotten that. Uh, I think it should be available to the people. And um, we've paid forty. Uh, we've paid fifty-four thousand dollars for our two-year contract already, which was forty-six thousand. Now I'm not complaining about the amount of money, but I want something in return. I want those pictures, and I haven't gotten them. That is for the county to give us, but I think it's incumbent on you, uh, Mount Taylor Mustangs, to supply this to the county, who then gives it to the people who paid for it. So and I do appreciate the PCP. Thank you, Patience. So because it's an if request, and yes, I am aware of it, I need to refer that all of your questions about the content of the IPRA request to the county. I can tell you that $54,000 is an error. Is an error? Is an error. Yeah, that's, that, that, that is beyond correct. But um, I'd like to ensure that everybody has an opportunity to the best extent possible to ask questions and then we're happy to talk um, afterwards, after, after the meeting ends. So nobody here gets to know what the answer is going to be. So to, can, you, can you state your, so your IPRA requests um, are being processed by the IPRA team at the county. Um, and they said that one was closed and I, I said, well, I kind of beg to differ. Okay. And then I sent it back to you, and I've heard nothing back. You, okay, and I'm not the info officer, so... Oh, well, I sent it to that one, too, and you. Okay, okay. So we can, we can talk afterwards, but let's make sure we have okay, time so There was a hand up here, and then, sir, I'll get to you. Um, my name is Jennifer Black. Thank you, um, council member, for the opportunity to ask a question to you, Dr. Henry. Thank you um, for taking my question, um, which is how... Um, the presentation for Fish and Wildlife, which was 18 horses, how is that, or how will you factor that into your, um, into your plan? So thank you for that question, that's great. So my understanding, the Buffalo Track is potentially an option, but not a definite option. Yeah, let's say that a little louder. Is that accurate, or do we not have even that answer right now? No, there's no, there's no answer to that right okay. now, and that's the... That's the you know, again, if, if that's something like that would happen, I mean, that's the capacity that 3,100 acres essentially could take, at least those 3,100 acres. Is that okay? Yes, uh, did you do any assessment of uh, the impact of the horses on uh, local uh, um, water sources and, uh, and safety areas and things like that? The last photo was the presentation. It's my safety and my Odoma well. It, and we've experienced a lot of damage to our safety and also uh, our water quality has gone down. And uh, you know, it's very little water and it's a very delicate resource and the safety is very delicate and there's only like seven of us that, to take care of it. And uh, they've gone up on a, where we have a cliff where the safety runs along and they just torn the heck out of it. And they, they have no business being up there. It's very dangerous. And, uh, you know, Sorry, the wildlife. They don't have the ability to fence it. It's, it's all private property now. And, and uh, going up through there with all through those right away. We've got about three minutes if you can ask your okay, questions so directly. My question was have you, have you taken right. that into consideration? So I understand that's very important. That's actually not, that's beyond the scope of our contract. So I think that's an important consideration for the future. And it's not something that we're contracted to do. At this time. And I hope the county does. So your statistics on the 28 foals that were born, uh, did you count them or that just by how did you get that information that there were 28 new foals? So we did count them, yes. And they're, where are they located? So they're uh, dispersed among the bands that... And what bands, bands again? Could you like, specify which ones, what area? 
in Placidas? So we've got um, several bands in the Tecobote area, sort of the Overlook area of off 165. Okay, so how many bands there? Two? Um, so off the top of my head, I won't be, I'm not able to give you that, that specificity with 19 bands. So, so you're saying, that, I want to specify that. this. Okay. You're saying there's 28 new folds across Placidas. Correct. 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 Okay. That has so, been counted so far, yes. That has been counted. Mm -hmm. So we're looking from the Overlook over to Telcote to Indian Flats. I mean, we're looking down at into the village. The village. And yes. And those are ones. Yes. So we have one minute left. Okay, I don't know who had their hand up first. Does anybody have an opinion on that? Um, the bull that was kicked and killed, what, what, uh, did he just get kicked once, or just, you know, I mean, you're, you're making it sound like he just got kicked all to hell. So my understanding from the person that witnessed it is that the fool was kicked to death, um, and they were not able what to area, stop what? it and intervene. What area? In what area was it? So it was um, near... Did you go out and see it? It was, Checo, it was, again, the, the, the Las Cortes, the, some of the properties up the Las Cortes. I did not see it, so to be clear, this was something that was told to me. Yeah. Okay, so it's just rumor without seeing it. So, so as are all the counts without seeing them. So, we, I, I, would like, I would like more information on that, but, you know, okay. like we need, asking we need the county to is like hitting a brick wall right. because they won't answer so, questions. So I've been asked not to share names because things are so emotional, and so I, I respect what you're saying, and I, I respect your perspective, and what I can tell you is that this is what I was told by someone who cares. Yeah, but you won't so tell us. You can't tell us who so or where. One more question. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, um, your management plan that is going to be presented possibly the next meeting, three months from now, uh, and you're not sure whether you can include BLM land, so our land are you including? Because you're not going to include my private property. Um, and so, and, and what is the carrying capacity? How are you going to figure the carrying capacity of the private properties that you are going to uh, include? And are you going to approach each and every one of those individuals and say, hey, can we include your private property in this management plan? So we will have some potential options for the community to consider in the management plan. Um, and no, to answer your question, we will not be approaching individual private landowners to ask if they can include, um, if they want their property included or not. It would be for the community to decide if that's something no, that we no, all decided was going to happen. Right. Um, so that's, that's just one. I understand what you're saying. That's, so that's one example. Of the okay, so we're going to move on, but I want to say this one last time. Dr. Herman and Mount Taylor Mustangs are, are not Sandoval County government. They're they're really the vendor for this initiative. So so the, so Mr. Anisio getting into you know legal issues that they would have. Um, you know, you next, next to support, yeah, or, or authority. But again, it's it's, it's going to be a near working draft that is going to then be something for everybody to look at, right? Because that's what you want in order to give feedback and then really work it together. Yeah, as but you need my feedback. And otherwise, and everybody you. thinks that, wow, this management plan has been approved understood, by all the neighbors. Understood, and, and we will be sure to clarify that. Thank you. We're going to be moving on to subcommittee updates. Can you get that to um, so I think that we're going to start with the um, short-term subcommittee, and Captain Mills Yvonne's going to bring you the clicker. I don't know if you want to stand over here. Oh, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, just, uh, uh -huh. Yeah, I have to. I have a meeting that, uh, that I have to attend to, so I'm going to go ahead and. We still have a quorum. Thank you. Okay, so just Thank you. Again. Make sure you leave your cell phone for everybody as you're walking out. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, serves the, to develop greater public safety measures, speed control, fencing, cattle guards, etc., provide public awareness, and work to create a cooperative climate with the community. Help to support the fertility control program, short term planners, folks focused on feasible. Immediate interim measures that mitigate risk. 
So one of the things I'm sure you guys are aware of is that we have drastically increased traffic enforcement in Placidas. At first, everybody was happy with it. Recently, I'm getting a lot of frowns about it. Especially Not the, enough yet. <laughs> keep bringing it. Especially the two DWI checkpoints. Just know that those checkpoints one of the questions that has come up about those checkpoints is that's federal money. That is not out of the San Juan County budget. Um, those officers and all that are being, that's all federal and state funding money. And um, those checkpoints are spread throughout the county. Just so happens to us, it's a deadly we have a couple of procedures. Um, but we have aggressively increased uh, the speeding, uh, looking for speeders, um, and, and in places where the horses are close to the road. Also, if I get an email or something, we, I'll, I'll call the patrol, I'll have them run by, try to shoot the horses off the road, and work those areas also for speeding um, when I get those emails, uh, reference the horses being close to the road. I have got a few recently on 165 um, around the post office. I've got some around the Overlook. Um, those are two pretty good hot spots where I think there's two or three hanging around, and they, they're not in the roads, but they're very close to the road. Um, when people are, are calling in on them. Um, we do have the, the wildlife uh, vehicle collision pamphlet. Um, we have been giving them to drivers when we stop them. Um, and also there, we um, disperse them at the Mer and the Placidas Cafe and different places like that. We are working on a pamphlet um, and it, it's done. There's just some final um, grammatical error that, that I have on it that we're, we're fixing. But it's basically a pamphlet that's going to kind of guide people on viewing the horses, how not to get close, um, not to try to get pictures with your arms around them. There's no questions here. Um, so the dangers of feeding them, and also it's going to talk about feeding them close to the roads. If you feed them close to the roads, then you're drawing them to the roads, so you're creating a traffic hazard. Um, and what to do, who to email. Um, if you do have the horses on the road, so that way I can get a patrol unit out there to take care of them. Um, I am looking at purchasing, so I don't know if all of you are aware, but our fiscal year just started this week. Um, so I am looking at purchasing some signs. These would be permanent <coughs> signs that would be placed in county easement, county property, county roadways, um, where people where we've had a continuous feeding problem that has caused a public safety hazard. Um, another one would be, um, so this is an idea that actually, um, Bloomfield, New Mexico, when I was driving through there not too long ago, I noticed that they had some signs like this. Basically, the, the, the final signs that are like for the election, you know, vote for me. <laughs> And they had them in center medians and they had them in different places. And I did notice that that did slow people saw those and they slowed down. That's a pretty cheap way um, for us to let people know, hey, slow down. So I'm going to purchase some of these signs. That's a, I don't know if I'm going to go with that emblem. That I just kind of copied there. That was, there said, boom, field, slow down. And then they had their little badge in it. But basically, I'm going to come up with something um, that's simple, not very wordy, that the deputies can go put that out and they can leave it there for a couple of days if the horses are in that area. Just hold your question. This is a sign also, um, and I, I do have these already. Um, these are basically um, just small little signs that we can tag on the fence on state property or county property um, if people are feeding the horses again on the road. Um, We're not talking about it. And if, if push comes to shove, we could write somebody a citation for littering. Putting hay on an easement, or putting hay on county property, county roadway is littering. You can call it food, but it's still, we would have to have a judge decide mm -hmm. yes when push comes to shove. But we could run a citation. Uh, we're still looking at getting some speed display radar trailers. Um, and we're hoping to get that in this budget here. And those could be moved around also. I'm sure everybody knows these are pretty effective. I'm sure you guys have seen them. All over, they have them in Albuquerque, North Valley. Um, let's see this elementary. Um, so we have been um, doing some school initiatives using our officer that we have. We have a deputy that let's see this famous um, at the different schools. Uh, Lieutenant Tomlinson is in charge of that program. And um, so we have been talking to the children. We've created some little coloring thing. 
um, some information that they can take home to their parents, and um, just try to educate the kids, start a program, start educating the kids, and they can bring that information home to their parents. So currently, um, to try to handle the problem, if we do have a horse that's hit or one that's injured, um, we are trying to spin up the sheriff's office to where we can um, respond to that problem. Um, Lieutenant Tomlinson is actually one of the ones that has been already trained in technical large animal emergency rescue. And also, we just uh, currently sent our animal control officer um, to that training also, and we plan on, we do have an open position for an animal control um, officer. We had it posted, we did not get very many people interested in it, we are going to be reposting it. Um, and that person, when that person is hired, they will also attend this training and be trained. Um, I'll let uh, Lieutenant Tomlinson just kind of say a little bit of word about, about that. Plan. So, um, we got this started in Corrales mostly when I was there with the fire department. Um, they, were, uh, they were able to purchase a lot of the slings, a lot of the items to help mostly rescue large animals that have fallen in their irrigation ditches. The, we actually did uh, river rescues and so forth. Um, they have a San Juan County wide team that will, that will respond if, if asked um, from Corrales. We'll go out and, and help you know, rescue whatever animals in distress. Um, right as, as soon as we got started, they were coming off of San Diego man caves with the dog and a, a search and rescue took care of the man and then they took care of the dog that was up there and actually scrapped him down and carried him down. So it's a really good program. It takes about a week to go through. And they teach you everything from killing, water rescues, um, how to deal with large animals. Um, and it, it, although we're still debating on uh, how we're going to handle situations when it comes down to it, uh, it, it did train us in how to uh, put down an animal if that's absolutely the last resort. Um, but we're also in negotiations and talking to different vets in the area that will respond uh, should that be needed to do it uh, humanely and quickly from that standpoint instead of having to use different means to show the problem. But all of that's contained in all the training we go to. There's also about three other different trainings that I plan to uh, next year sending um, not only myself, my own control, but possibly a couple deputies too, which have shown interest in assisting with this. So that means that would be the end of our update. Terrific. Captain Mills, um, thank you. Thank you as well, Frank. We will now turn to Jessica for um, long term. So. Resign. Sure. Um, <coughs> hi, everyone. Uh, so the uh, long term subcommittee has structural changes to the committee um, due, uh, due to the fact that um, I've got some life changes up ahead of me. Mainly, uh, I'm going to be having a baby. <laughs> uh, apparently, I missed my PZP dose. <laughs> well, of course, fertility humor for you. Um, so, um, so there, there's no expectation that this will impact uh, my ability to serve on the council, uh, but it started to make sense um, to uh, look at shifting the workload of the committee, um, and uh, Peggy Roberts has very graciously agreed to um, start taking over that work, and um, it actually recently occurred to me, and I don't know if there needs to be some sort of formal council approval of, of an additional leave, or if that's something that can just happen. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we've been very busy, so I feel like I'm happy to go ahead and get to this point. Right here. It's the long term planning committee's goal to meet with as many Placidas residents or their organizational representatives as possible. We've met with Las Placidas Association, ESCA, the Placidas Chamber of Commerce, Coronado Soil and Water Conservancy. 
Conservation District, San Antonio de los Huertas land grant representatives, and representatives from <coughs> three homeowners associations. We have contacted 15 homeowners associations that are attempting to meet with each. We are asking to meet with these associations or their boards who can relay the information to their membership. We realize that most of the horses exist in areas that do not have homeowners associations, like Mustang Basin, Camino de los Huertas, Rosa Castillo, Tecolote, those are examples. And we are exploring <coughs> ways to host meetings with those residents. The Long-Term Planning Committee has been recomposed and is now made up of the four citizen members, which is Jessica, Paul, myself, and Anya. Because we feel that it's important that as many council members as possible um, can hear Placetan's concerns. Whenever one of the four of us cannot meet, we try to get someone else from the council, like the commissioner or Ms. Ryan, to come in. So as many of us as possible can be there. Um, in our meetings, we distribute a handout explaining the purpose and composition of the horse council, how to correspond with us, how to find meeting minutes and presentations, which are located on the county website. We explain that Placitas is surrounded by federal and tribal lands where horses currently are not allowed. The reality is free roaming horses that reside in Placitas roam on private property or land grant property. We explain how currently the Livestock Board cannot assist landowners with free roaming horses. And, and the county doesn't have infrastructure like trailers and, and, um, and stockyards and that sort of thing to help private landowners. We also hand out and explain New Mexico Statute 77-18-5 that regulates wild horses in the state. We address the misconception some residents have regarding New Mexico's fence-out laws. These laws only apply to livestock, and per the previous mentioned statute, wild horses are not livestock. So the assumption that if you don't want free roaming horses on your property, it's your responsible to fence them out, is not true. And lastly, we explain the work the County Commission contracted Mount Taylor Mustang to perform. Then we get to the real purpose of the meeting, and that is to hear the Placetans' opinions. We are interested in their experiences with the free roaming horses, positive and negative, and how the horses are affecting their lives. We ask if they would find value in having a nearby horse sanctuary. We discuss with them who should take responsibility for the free roaming horses, and what that responsibility would look like, and who would pay for it. We ask if the responsibility for keeping horses off private property where they are not wanted be on the individual property owner or on the entire Placidus community. We ask if they feel the county should adopt enforceable rules of engagement such as feeding and watering. And most importantly, we ask if they have suggestions for legal, long-term, humane, and sustainable solutions. So in conclusion, if your neighborhood, your group, book club, etc. would like to meet with us, please contact us via the county website. Thank you. Good. Thank you. And perfect timing. So um, we are going to move on to public comment. We have 11 people who have signed up to speak with a um, max limit of three minutes each. And Peggy, I'm going to ask you Where's to be the timekeeper again. Solution? And so um, we're going to start with um, Fred Grice, back. Freddie Grice, back. You're up. Did you want to have a sign-up? Most people didn't know there was a sign-up sheet. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Okay, so the, okay, so I want to I want to state this again. Um, it's been stated many times. It's also when we pass it out. It's also in our resolution that. Those who want to sign up for public comment need to do so before commencement of the meeting. The list is then pulled so that we can account for time. So we're going to keep moving. So, sir, this, this is for public comment. I'm going to move to the next person on the list, um, Lynn Montgomery. Yes, um, 
This is Scar, which is a chicken shit. Yeah. I'll pass this around. Mm -hmm. Thank you. He was a beautiful horse, free roaming horse down in Rio Dosa. Um, this is Star Dead. It's kind of graphic. The horse in Rio Dosa was after me. Hmm. What about it? What's your point? So I got this, is, this is a quote out of an article down there about this incident. Um, Facebook. Lincoln County Sheriff Robert Shepard said Wednesday that the accident occurred on the 4 p.m. Tuesday and a car hit and killed the stallion. Speeding apparently, speeding apparently was not a factor, he said. There wasn't much damage to the car, so it didn't appear she was driving at a high rate of speed. The speed limit there is 45 miles per hour, and even at that speed, it could have killed the horse. There's nothing this lady could have done. I'm good, thank you. Yeah, I'm running into this horse. Um, it, it was an accident. Um, this is the way horses are. If we keep doing this, horses are going to die. And, uh, probably people are going to get injured and may even kill So uh, I just wanted to point that out. Despite all of it, your efforts to make and say that's fine. Thank you, Mr. Montgomery. Next is Lori Jaramillo. Uh, yeah, first I'd like to say that um, so if we can have everyone's attention, so this is how you have the floor. If um, if everybody would please limit when they do the question and answer things, because some people like to try to educate, educate and unfortunately it takes please up the question and answers <laughs> please address the so that the rest of us don't get to ask a question, like me, who wanted to ask the question and did not get to because some people consumed so much time. Um, the other thing is, you guys are doing a great job, and I am appalled at the negative stuff that is directed towards you guys individually and as a group. Both the committees and the council are doing a great job. And Karen Herman and Mount Taylor Mustangs are impeccable and are doing a wonderful job. So I just want to state that, that there are people like me out there that really appreciate what you guys are doing. That's Thank really all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Doris Forshee. Hi there. I actually don't have any questions. I mean, I actually saw it's, some... This is public comment. I actually have some... Um, I feel better this meeting to see some progress made. As I stated at the last meeting, that I thought it was one-sided, and uh, yeah, I, I'm happy to hear that we're talking reality and what the options look like. And what's the reality? The reality is that we cannot sustain the force code in the seat. Yeah. So this it's is public comment, and Ms. Horshey has the floor, and wow. I think you were just concluding. Mr. Miles, the floor is yours. Uh, first off, I'd like to ask Jessica Johnson and Ann Lyon to resign. Jessica Johnson, you do not live in Placitas. You do not represent Placitas. You do not have horses. You do not own horses. And Ann Ryan, your, your, your disregard for the Inspection of Public Records Act is, a, is dismal. Uh, as for not contacting everybody in the world, don't contact the two, the two people who do a hell of a lot for the horses who, when they're shot, when they're hit by cars, I put them down with a gun. Uh, and I haul them off. And he carries it around with me. Mr. Neese. And I've, I've done Mr. it by, with permission from the sheriff's department. Yeah. And the rest of my Mr. time Miles, is going please address my rest of my time is going to the patient. Look what you did. Okay. Okay. So um, my rest of my time is going to patient. And so, if, and we hope to have time because everyone's now, right now. Less, she's going to continue. Everyone's taking less than three minutes. So, um, Mr. Miles, you have three minutes for public comment. And if you are concluding, we're moving on, and we hope to have time for those. I, I'm giving patience the rest of my time. You, you, you've already wasted 30 seconds of my time. Well, that shouldn't be allowed. So we're, a it is a okay. lot because they, the county refuses to let people speak and let people ask here, questions. Here. And, and the county refuses to answer questions. And you got people on there who are not citizens who should resign. And you're, you're ignoring the public constantly. I'd like to know about cattle guards. You want to come and throw me out? Go ahead. I'm, I'm sick of this bullshit. 
Okay. Ooh. Ooh. So, yeah. Thank you. Oh, no, no, don't do that. Just let him stay. Just have him on. on. Yes, he does. Yeah. Just let like, just this is what they want. This is what they want. Excuse me, ma'am. Excuse me, ma'am. It's been just so simple to let me speak. It's very simple to let somebody speak for, for, for a minute and a half. I gave her half my time. Thank you. Thank you. So good. So, um, Ms. Nuremberg. Um, actually, the BLM left, but I'm still going to ask about herd management What's that? and wondering why we can't take some of the BLM land that has no carry capacity and some of it is sitting as islands. And why well, can't horses, can go sit back now. why couldn't the Placidas wild horses be someplace in the community and why wasn't that actually looked at? We could have, those horses, a lot of the horses to be sustained. So that could have been the place they would have been sustained. They would have very simple needs, food, water, safety. We as a community could not provide that for those horses that were shipped out of here. Those were Placidas horses. And it's going to be really a shame to have that happen again. Thank you. Thank you. Are you, are you, are you, are you oh, I need to as it relates to um, the BLM, they you know they are their own entity, and I know that lots is being mm -hmm. looked at there. And I'm you know honestly you know we can't you know represent. But that. there are a lot that don't have a carry capacity, and if people, I have no idea what the permits are, and they're very little in terms of money. And wouldn't they rather have some income and revenue on those absolute nothing lands and have these horses? Be sustained, which this community probably would be very, you know, very happy. With. Sure, I know lots. I know lots is being looked at. Okay, I know lots is being looked at. Thank you. Um, may I also? Oh, this also is BLM, um, but they they're uh, seeking private ranches to maintain horses, and it's a very good program. And I have handout, or I can tell you where to, where to look at it. It's only been on for about a year. But the notorious bad BLM is finally doing something that makes some sense. Wonderful. I, I know the signpost reported on that, and I know that you know folks can get that information. So, okay. um, so we're going to move on to um, Sandra Simmons. Simons. Simons. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. Um, I've lived in Placitas on Ringo Gulch, the last road up Las Huertas Canyon for 38 years. After 40 years of teaching, I'm on a farm. Just took out 150 pounds of cherries, 175 pounds of garlic. There were no free roaming horses before 2009. Okay. And as a teacher with pension, with Las Huertas running across my creek, it has cost me a pretty penny to fence my land, and uh, you leave the gate open because the horses are on Ringo Gulf, they're on 165. You leave the gate open, and the next thing you know, they've stripped the bark off two peach trees, a plum tree. Sounds like a deer. They've broken the coping on my pond. I had to pay for all this. Once everyone who wants to have the horses has put up their $5,000 to buy a chunk of land, then I'll say, that's plenty. Um, I love horses. My daughter had a horse. The property next to me was a uh, horse breeding ranch for the first 25 years I lived there. I don't understand why all these people who are so worried about Placidus' horses don't take their money and stop feeding them and making the herds bigger and, you know, buy them. But we just heard that the more you feed them, the more they not that's, that's not true. Okay. That's not true. Anyway. If you love the horses, own the horse. Right. Provide the water. Yes. Call the brain. Get the vet. Break the ice on the water in the winter. Yeah. You know? That's what and we're doing. Maybe if you're lucky, someday your teenage daughter will discover boys, and you won't have to do that anymore. <laughs> well, 
And you know, I think you need to be gelding colt. Mm -hmm. Is that time, Peggy? From mm -hmm. okay. I think you need to be gelding colt. I would like to see that in the plan. And I intend to call every single time in the last five days. I've had horses on Gringo Home. Ma'am, please on address the council. I need your number, okay? Um, He's on the board. <laughs> He's on the board. <laughs> he moved. I couldn't yeah, move. I'm sorry. Okay. He moved. Um, I just think that uh, for the people who live in the village, who have lived past the village, there used to be Indian rice grass. There used to be winter fat all along 165. I used to collect the seeds. It's not there anymore. There's snake grass. There's so much more forward salt. There's all these invasive species all along the road. And twice in the last three years, doing the speed limit, I've come up at night. I babysit for grandkids. I've come up late at night and had to swerve off the road because there's a horse, a herd of horses in the middle of the road. They we are, at least had the common comments. sense to run across the road. Thank you for your comments. Mm -hmm. um, Donna Von um, Seton? I would also like to add to that, after living in Placidus for 42 years, mm -hmm. that we never had this problem until there was a drought and people started cutting their horses loose and the rest cutting the tents. Thank now, you. what you are addressing is not solving the problem of horses in the roadway and damage to our property. You, all you want to do is have them uh, sterilized and uh, you'll be darn lucky if you get them all sterilized but that does not address our public safety and it does not address our public decimation of our property and believe me there's thousands of dollars being destroyed on people who try to have some kind of landscape and grow something because these animals are coming in and invading our space now until you guys realize that this is more than a pregnant horse issue this is a public safety issue, and you do something about this, and you remove these horses to some place where they are maintained and killed. fenced in. Killed, right? said killed. There needs to be someone held accountable for this, because this is a new problem. And these people that are complaining about these, uh, saying these horses should roam free, have never probably owned horses in their lives. Oh, right. Or up until the last five oh, years. But they, we've name seen this, we've never seen this in the 42 years that I've lived here until just recently. Mm -hmm. And you guys need to do something, and you may need to make it final, and not just pussyfoot this up to the point to where they're not <coughs> they're still a public hazard and, and destroying property. Thank you very much for your attention. I know Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Next is Julio um, Carantini. 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 Oh, thank you. Yes. <coughs> Hi, I'm Julio Carantini, and I live in uh, Placitas on Tecolote Road. I love the horses that come on my property. They're fed. They're watered. They're gentle. They've just become like the herd that visits my neighbor. I will take, I've, I've had horses since I was little. And, well, I grew up in the military. My dad came back from World War II and I was born, he stayed in. And I wound up in the, in the Army, retired, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Special Forces, and I love my property, I love my land, and I love these horses. When the herd that, I don't know, I want to say belongs to me, with the two white mares and their little colt, whom my daughter's uh, best friend's daughter named Rodeo. She's seven years old, and she gets to name all of the little colts, the little mares, fillies that come by, and I have absolutely no problem. There's never, ever been a problem. I think the only time there was a problem last year when one of the stallions broke a colt's uh, mm -hmm. neck. And 
I have to go over there and put them down. And that hurt. Beautiful and cold. And, uh, you know, I just support the horses. I love them. And I, I can't see. Get out of my property. I can close my front gate. And I can do this and that to keep them out, but I don't want to keep them out. I have my horses in my corral. And as a matter of fact, I have a problem. Because now I have two wild horses in my corral. And there's nothing like getting up in the morning going into the barn to get the feed, and you go, wait a minute. <laughs> How many horses are in here? And you go out and you look, and one of the gates is knocked down. Yeah. And it's like, nope, we're not going out. We've got chow, and we have Thank you. grain. Thank you for your kindness and compassion. So, you know, they're just there's cool. more to it, more compassion in this room. Good job, Julio. Oh, thank you. So, um, Kristen Darnell, she's a Actually, I would be happy to yield my time. I came here so I could become informed. Um, I am a horse person. I was raised here in New Mexico in a professional horse family. And I've done my share of research on wild and feral horses in the state of New Mexico. <coughs> and I have not been updated on the placebus um, situation since about 2010. So I came here to become updated and uh, Contrary to how everyone here may feel, being a native, I see that everyone is going incredible lengths to try to make this work. And all I can say is God bless all of you, and I really hope the horses in the long run benefit from all of this. Uh, and I think everyone is doing a good job, no matter how they look to you all, but for me it's just kind of stepping in at this point in history. I think there's a lot more pieces that are existing than did exist, and a lot more working together right. existing than did exist in 2008. So, good work, everybody, and that's all. Speak out when others were abusing their time limits or the, the question and answer process. We, I think we need to get a, con a control on that and. And um, if a question is not being asked within a quick period of time, in a question and answer period, then that person needs to sit down so that others do have the chance to speak up and say uh, politely what they have to say, rather than um, the wacko. Um, this would be yes. I know the same thing. It's been a that didn't work quite. Right time stops while he's not. Please, please continue. Okay, so um, also the long term uh, committee. I was, uh, I, I felt really good about your report. And thank you very much for that. I felt mm -hmm. that you were yes. earnest about that, and it's important. I do have a little problem with the makeup of your committee being that um, I think some of you don't have horses at your property, probably never have or have had very little uh, exposure to the realities of the horses. I would like to come to you at some of your meetings, if, that, um, if it is at all possible. Um, yeah. And I would like you to um, continue in the vein that you presented today. So please, please do um, and, and stay open-minded about it. Um, uh, Mr. Zimmerman, uh, you mentioned uh, the, the disease. I, I, I'm not familiar with it, but um, you didn't mention how it might apply to 124 horses here in Placidus and how those 124 horses might affect uh, <coughs> private horses. And then, um, um, Mr. Julio, I, I enjoyed um, your Mr. Mr. Lee's pleased to only address the council, not, not individual. Um, um, but Mr. Julio does um, 
uh, doesn't take into consideration his neighbors. He's not a considerate neighbor. Um, he doesn't care about, um, he loves the horses, uh, but he doesn't love his neighbors. And so neighbors, that's very important that um, we all consider the range that you're all talking about, the, current, the, the management plan that you're talking about, you're talking about range on private property. So make sure that you take that into full consideration in all of your comments. And, and yes, it, now I have nothing against you, um, but I, and I like horses, but the problem is what is the range you've got to have a real management plan. And so far we don't have it. Thank you, Ms. O'Neill. Thank you, Ms. O'Neill. So, time out, everyone. That, that's why my. Sir! <laughs> so, let me say a few things. We have two hours allotted for this meeting, a lot of information to share. There is tons of information on the website that we try to direct people to. There are multiple opportunities to provide public comment at three in the morning if you want to. So we want to manage it in a way so that everybody is respected and that everybody's voice is heard. We have time now for probably two other public comments, potentially three. I'm going to say this again in the future. We happen to have time now. You need to sign up before the meeting. Um, in order to be called. And so we're going to do that and then we're going to move on to the next agenda item. So by way of show of hands of somebody who has not spoken previously, who didn't sign up for public comment or heard some things and would like to, um, we've got probably two or three slots left before we're going to move to council comments and then adjourn. So um, do we have Anybody who would like to provide public comment? Patience. patience. Okay. Okay, patience or doubt. Right, but nobody else put up the hands. Let's not waste the time, okay? All right. Now, we passed, we, if you look at the drought from the last hundred years, you can see that between 1930 and 1940, we had the worst drought. Worse droughts than what we've had now. But we have had a pretty bad drought, pretty much ongoing from 2006-ish or whatever. Now, in 2007, <clears throat> what was proactively working to, to pass a management plan in 2004, 5, 6, and 7? We passed a management plan in 7. Everybody, uh, the, our government uh, evaded the law, and they've been told that in court now twice. And so now we're PZPing, and thank you to Mount Taylor Mustangs for that. Um, so uh, that law was to manage them. Now, if we're behind, right, the reason why uh, we're behind is because of evasion of the law. Now, we're not evading, we have signs for horses, we have PZP. But what we don't have yet is education of our government people. I think people up here are very innocently um, misunderstanding the law and haven't read the fact that the judge said that private property just like livestock if a person doesn't want a horse a wild horse on their property the judge said that they not only have the right but they have the obligation to fence out the horse. So I want to, I'm going to share that decision with Peggy and with, again, Jessica Johnson and with the attorney, etc., and you, Ann Ryan. Now, I think that's really important because, yes, private property is part of the range of every wild animal. So I want to say that. The other thing I want to say is that uh, thank you for uh, lawman. <laughs> you did put guardrails on your thing. Coming from Wagon Mound yesterday, um, or day before yesterday, um, before I get onto the highway and Wagon Mound and many places in New Mexico, there's cattle guards 
before you get to I-25. We don't have that. We don't have cattle guards anywhere. And we have been asking for them for many, many years, just like PZP. Why? And, and, and I want to say that this is really important. I agree with your signage, Sheriff Mann, that we should have that sign that says, please don't feed the horses near the road. I don't agree with saying, don't feed the horses. Why? Because it's not scientifically proven. There's no peer-reviewed paper uh, that says horses stop uh, getting pregnant when they're skinny. In Thank fact, you. Thank you, patience. Uh, uh, but I so I want to say that Wo does agree to feeding right now because we didn't PZP for all those years. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am, you're interrupting half her speech. I just have something quick to say because we are very divided in the sub room. Um, I think there needs to be an educational. My name is Jennifer Lesh. So I feel that we need to have an educational. Uh, grouping here to educate and stop the propaganda. We have some people on a certain side that feel that dispersing and getting rid of the horses, where do you think those horses are gonna go? They're gonna go on BLM land and they're gonna go in pens and they're basically going to just stand there and die and be starved and there's no way that they're going to uh, have a good life. What we want is the horses to have a good life. They were here, they're here, they're, it's our problem. We need to deal it with a very humane way. Gathering them up and shipping them away is not the answer. As we all know, because we bought them back, thank you very much, Mike. Ma'am. So, that's how I feel, and I feel that there needs to be an educational uh, committee to educate people who do not own horses, who have never owned horses, that are listening to people who sort of own horses, but are not humane in terms of the overall looking uh, for those, looking after for those. The law as well. And the law, yes, and I do agree on patience on this one. So there needs to be some sort of educational warning to educate the public, because it's not happening. Thank you, thank you. We have time for one more, sir. You already you spoke. You have become you a favorite, clearly, of those in the room, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so we did so this. So I can have a as to what we No, you cannot. Uh, no, you, no, you may not. So we, is there anyone else? You know, they are not upholding the law. And they are uneducating the people as they go door to door. And I think they're innocently been miseducated. And I think this is an issue for the county. It's a legal issue. It will be. Thank you for your words. And I just want to say that in this discussion, we're talking about living beings. We're not talking about feral animals, the stray animals. We're talking about living beings, and if you've spent any time with them, you know that they have something to teach us. And maybe what they have to teach us is how to get along with each other, and how to listen to other people's points of view. Thank you. Yay, Sally. Than Wallace. <laughs> yeah. I've been called a lot of other things over the 35 years. <laughs> Mr. Bill, would you like to take the floor? Yes, I'd like to take the floor. Mr. Fish. Yes, I do have some things I'd like to say. Um, first of all, the people have talked about the question and answers during the presentations. The purpose of that question and answer period for this presentation is <coughs> that we have somebody who's, who's an expert, either the BLM or Karen or, or whoever is presenting something, and the idea is, okay, let's, if you have a question of the expert who's trying to educate the council as well as people, ask them a question. It's not for someone to either argue with them or, or present contrary information. So, so I really do think that it, it would be helpful for people to realize the question and answer session is just that. Ask questions of the 
presenter to get their thoughts, their information, rather than giving your own comments. I, I'd ask people to do that. But what I really wanted to talk about, and let me say one other thing. I lived in Placidus for 39 years. I uh, owned horses for about 30 years. They've all died now. Uh, I have horses come to my property. I have fruit trees that come eat my fruit trees. And, and the apples have fallen on the ground. They're welcome. Um, I don't see any problem with them. Um, I do know that the people are talking about horses being hit. There's a deer that was killed on the road. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I see dogs. Deer. Yeah, I see yeah. deer fairly regularly. So there are, there are wild animals, and and they are hit by cars. But what I really wanted to talk about was, what are we doing here? I've been watching for the last dozen years, 15 years, a totally dysfunctional situation where we have some people in the community fighting other people in the community with opposite goals and, and no no solutions and no progress. And when people say, well, I don't want horses on my property, but don't kill them. And I, I good, what are we gonna do? The purpose of this council, and the reason I agree, uh, maybe I regret it, but <laughs> <laughs> the reason I, I agreed to, to spend the time on this thing was because the goal, according to the county commission, was supposed to implement legal, long-term, humane, sustainable recommendations and solutions that effectively address the issue to the best possible, uh, to the best extent possible. And this council is supposed to make a recommendation to the uh, to the county commission with a solution of some sort. And most of what I've heard are people talking about either problems for those on this side of the council, I'll call it that, I don't want to put a label on them, and then there are other people who go, I'm not talking just about you, who love the horses and they're on this side of the fence. But nobody say, and, and people say, well, keep the horses off my property, but don't kill them. What are we gonna do with them? I mean, the, 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 our, yes, we need to hear the problems. Fence the property. We want to understand the problems, but what's the solution? Is it that the county spend the money to fence everybody's property? Or does the individual, by the way, patients Individual said the law is about fencing. It was a decision. I think she, what she's referring to. Yes. In the Lincoln County, it's on appeal, so it's a district court decision. Um, it's the law of the land. No, it's a district court decision that, that affects only Lincoln. It's a final County. judgment. But it might be if the court of appeals adopts it, it's the law of the land. It's the, the, it's the current law. Finding seventy or finding a fact number seventy says any property owner that does not want quote wild horses close quote on his her land has the right and obligation to fence them out. That's this judge's decision. It's not the law of the land. It's, but it could, if, it, if the Court of Appeals adopts that, it will be the law in the Mexico. It is until. Court. It's not now, maybe it will be. I think that's, that's so, so uh, there was some, some basis for that, for that statement. But what I really would hope that people start thinking about is the solution. I'm, I'm trying to find a solution. I don't know what the solution is. I, I, you know, we're supposed to come up with a recommendation, keep the horses out of my property. How? Keep them off the road. Do it, well, keep them off the road. I think that- Carol Guard, friends. And, and I think Captain Mills talked about various things we can do to not, for God's sakes, don't throw feed on the highway so that you attract them. Don't throw them on Tecolote Road so they, they attract them. Keep it back 50 feet if you want to feed them. Send them to the drive all of those kinds of things, but that's not a long-term solution. What's the long-term solution? PZP. PZP is a solution, but we've got 124 horses by last count. And they're fine. And what are we gonna do with them? They're fine. Well, you think they're fine, this guy does. They look I, good. I, I, I would encourage you all to come up with solutions rather than complaints. That's my request. Thank you, Mr. Fish. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. That was so much. No? Okay. Answer questions. Yes. Thank you again for coming today. Um, you know, I, I have to, uh, ma'am, I would like to thank uh, the council again for their efforts because I do think this is difficult and challenging, and I was at the 
a detention center uh, board meeting yesterday, and I'll be going to the ethics board meeting shortly. So these volunteers that work in our communities to try and weave through our, our problem, it's our problem. So these guys who are from our community that are volunteering, I really, really want to say thank you. It's a treasure. And then I want to say to the people in this room who have been disrespectful, because there are people on both sides, that this is not how public meeting gets run. Anne has done her very best. But from this point forward, so come the next meeting, if you are out of line, if you are disrespectful, if you speak out, you should remove yourself because I would encourage our sheriff to remove you. And the reason I'm saying that is because I understand your passion. I feel your passion. But if you are not going to allow all voices to be heard, you are not doing the right thing. Exactly. So, excuse me, Mr. Mills. It's you are my, doing exactly what I'm Miles. talking about. Miles. I'm, you are doing exactly what I'm referring to. In a public meeting, you are given time to speak. You're lecturing us, and I don't appreciate it. And I'm exiting myself. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate that. Um, so when you are given an, an opportunity to give public comment, please feel free to do so. Please feel free to ask questions when they're around. We want those questions. We all want to learn more, but we do want to get to solutions. And so we only get to solutions if we are reasonable and have a have reasonable dialogue. So any again, thank you. I appreciate your time. I hope that um, uh, Dr. Zimmerman can inform us further about what our next steps will be around um, our virus uh, outbreak and how it might affect those of our free roamers, um, or if they will. And again, thank you for, thank you for your attendance. Thank you. Jessica. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll give a comment. Um, I, I like like so many have said before, I echo that um, I really appreciate those of you that come to these meetings um, to participate in good faith and to listen and um, to offer uh, ideas and share information in earnest. Um, my impression in the past few council meetings is that there are many people in this room that come here making assumptions about what, what each of us on this council have already decided needs to happen about these forces, um, which is surprising to me because, you know, my, I, of course, I, I know myself and I know my interactions with every single person on this council has been one of openness and listening and trying to come at this with a problem-solving attitude. Um, and so when we, when we have these meetings, that's, that's how we want to be with, with all of you as well. It's really difficult when some people in this room come here ready to battle us on what they think we've already decided. Um, and there's not enough listening. There's, you know, we're being accused of not addressing public safety. I mean, that's all Captain Mills talks about. Um, you know, we're accused of not addressing land degradation. We heard from the BLM some information. You know, we're, we're taking this piece by piece. This is a huge problem that's lasted a long, long time, and it hasn't been fixed on its own yet. So it's going to take us some time to build from the ground up and do this the right way. And so thank you for those of you who come to this, and hopefully the rest of you can also come to this the next time with more compassion and openness and listening and cooperation. Because we're, we're here trying to decide collectively um, what, what the community can do. Um, and, you know, and I'll just echo you know, that it's really important that correct information is shared, and not everyone in the audience is sharing correct information. Um, you know, it is important, as uh, Mr. Fish pointed out, um, kind of a basic legal fundamental is that a district court ruling is specific to that case. It is not binding law that applies to the rest of the state. 
one of the first things you learn in law school. Um, so, you know, I think it's important to um, look to some of the experts in the different areas and listen and learn. Um, certainly, I am here to do lots of listening and learning, and uh, I'm grateful to be a part of this. Thank you. Just a thank you, Dr. Zimmerman. The free roaming horses in Placidus are just as liable to break with vesicular stomatitis as any other horse, captive or not. I mean, it's, it's a viral disease, it's insect vectored. The insects don't pick and choose over who tastes better than others. Fortunately, they prefer horses right now over cattle, sheep, goats, pigs, lungs, and whatnot. All the other species that can get it, and we're only seeing it in horses. But it's part of life on the land. It, thank God it's not a killer virus. It causes some discomfort. It causes a lot of annoyance, uh, people and horses, but it's not killed anything yet. We <coughs> expect to see it. The strain of virus that we're seeing now is much more aggressive than the small breaks we've had over the last several years. This virus hasn't been here since the mid-90s when we had the big break that started at the Mexican border and went all the way to the Canadian border. And we're surprised at how late this started, but it's going both directions now. It's heading down through Valencia County. It's heading up. We'll have uh, several more counties that will be positive when we get the results coming in. And now that they're going to our state level, we'll get results quicker so we can update it. We're still relying on the federal government to do the situation reps, and they'll do them twice a week. But you can look at our website and we put them up as soon as they come in. It's at nmlbonline.com. There's some basic information there. But it's, if you're seeing drooling horses out there, that's more than likely what the problem is. Dr. Zimmerman, thank you. So um, the, uh, the only comment that I have is um, something reflective here that you know all of us recognize for everybody in this room, including everybody up here, that this is an emotionally contentious issue. And so when that happens, we don't always you know um, really absorb what is necessarily being communicated in that state. And so I want to thank not only everybody up here, but I want to thank Dr. Ann Hale. Um, she is a powerhouse nationally. She um, changed everything to do a presentation for this body last session. She was um, erroneously accused of, ne of taking sides or, 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 rather than when you go back and actually look at the presentation, she was not saying one thing or another. She was trying to provide guidance and wise counsel that as a community, we're gonna to have to make some decisions. And that's why she called it rules of engagement. We almost 7,000 people live here, right? We're not gonna get all 7,000 people to agree, but we do need to find some baseline standards where we will for those rules of engagement. And so she did everything along the line of any continuum, starting from you can do this or this or this or this. So I just wanna thank her in her absence um, because she didn't have to do that. She is a subject expert. Um, and in addition to thanking everybody up here. So we really appreciate everybody's time. This meeting is adjourned and um, several of us will hang around for about 15 minutes if, if, if anyone has questions. Dr. Hale is a blood expert. Sorry, I didn't know your name. Blood. Blood. Have you gone to law school? You have? And do you have a law degree? Was that? Do you have a law degree? I do. Can you not? You do? I'm sorry, it's a public meeting, so if you don't like it. No, I'm in a public building. I'm not. I'm asking you a question. Do you have a law degree? What's that? No, I never said I did. Is your attorney and all that? Is your attorney telling you that this district court ruling is? That's attorney-client privilege, and you should know that.